Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> uh, and now, uh, Richard, who, who I believe is, uh, amongst his many distinctions, is the first senior analyst to actually go to the regional anti-terrorism. Awesome. Uh, so, so he's actually had a look under the hood of the RATS mechanism uh, in Tashkent. So hope we can report on, on that. Yeah, too. By way of background, uh, the uh, embassy in Tashkent has been trying to get to the regional anti-terrorist structure of uh, the SCO for several years, and they couldn't do it. And then finally, when when I was coming, they sort of used me as bait. You know, we have an expert, you know, expert on terrorism who wants to exchange views with your, your team. And so they, they brought me in, but they also brought the embassy in, which was the key, really the key objective. But uh, so I don't know if it was the first, but it was very convenient in time for everybody. Um, I'm talking about, I guess there was a, there was supposed to be a Chinese participant or some Chinese expert on this in, in any case. But I'm going to, so I'm going to do China as well as the SEO, which I know a bit better. Um, uh, and I'll try to do it in just seven minutes, but of course, we can talk about anything that interests you in questions and in the answer. Seven minutes for each of the two parts. Um, China's goals, as far as I understand them, if you go outward geographically, you know, first of all, obviously, the internal uh, threats to China that might come from Central Asia, primarily Xinjiang, primarily concern about uh, how uh, uh, the um, Muslim extremists in, in Xinjiang, maybe operating elsewhere in China, are being inspired by or were supported by uh, sympathizers outside the region based in Central Asia. Uh, and that's obviously something the Chinese are most concerned about, particularly in the last year when there's been this upsurge of, of uh, terrorism, as the Chinese define it, within, within the country. So that's clearly a dominant function. And that, even going back a couple decades, it's really been a top Chinese concern always is about the relationship between Xinjiang and the rest of Central Asia. Because you just pull out all the political boundaries of the region. So look at each of the the, the geographic and ethnic entities, Xinjiang would fit in nicely as a Central Asian country in many ways. Um, and so there's just natural gravitation between those two. And it has benign effects. I mean, if the Chinese can, as they're trying to orient a lot of their trade and investment economic flows through Xinjiang into Central Asia, that will find regions together, it could raise prosperity in Xinjiang and so on. But it also could have negative flows, which sometimes overwhelms the, the, the possible economic benefits of the security trump. Who's uh, too burdensome for the economic uh, intercourse to there. Um, the, and then going outward, uh, the next concern clearly is um, it's going to be how uh, Chinese uh, interests in the region, uh, primarily economic, health and security, that is the country governments in the region uh, that have maintained stability on Chinese West, governments that haven't moved too closely to, for example, the United States or they cost out powers that might contain China, uh, governments that uh, generally have taken care to, to uh, repress groups that could also be considered uh, hostile to Chinese interests. Uh, governments are pretty open to Chinese investment and, 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 and trade. Uh, that's clearly an interest of theirs. They want, to, they want these governments to, to remain in power. There's no clear, um, you don't see any evidence that the Chinese have strong favoritism uh, in terms of who they want to maintain in power, but they do like the current regimes. Um, there's also ancillary concerns of China. Pakistan is a heavy Chinese investment. I mean, the Russians are complex. The Chinese are increasingly vocal about their concerns. The Pakistanis haven't been strong enough in repressing uh, terrorist groups or extremist groups, and that's had a <coughs> blowback in China and other countries. Um, but China, Pakistan, China just says it doesn't have any formal allies, but if it were to have one, Pakistan would come close to being one. Um, so long standing traditions, of course, focus on India, security cooperation, according to some interpretations, the Chinese helped Pakistan develop its nuclear uh, deterrent, uh, or at least missile strike force. Um, there's still strong security ties, economic ties less so. The Chinese are very happy when the U.S. comes in and supplies most of the economic aid, but they, they, they're they're looking more at Pakistan as one of their Silk Road prongs uh, as, as, as well as uh, Central Asia. Um, now, what has happened, though, is that so far the Chinese have been fairly fortunate. They've had other powers bear the burden of most of this. There's these security concerns. Uh, above all, there, there's Russia. I mean, you, you might think that 
with the Soviet Union breaking apart, you have all these independent states between Russia and China, and actually there would be some rivalry between the two for, for spheres of influence or competing alliances. And that may be the case somewhat, but it's overwhelmed by the shared interest and in cooperation we've seen. It's actually essentially it's been a sort of binding, and, and I would argue, Beijing and Moscow together, that they have common concerns about uh, dealing with global extremists, keeping the governments in power, avoiding social revolutions, limiting the role of external actors, particularly the United States. And so far, they've had a fairly good, good partnership. The Russians have uh, been somewhat accommodating, can you help me understand this, to, to, to Chinese interests in, in developing, getting access to energy and oil, because the Chinese, the Russian companies, instead of getting the oil and the gas shipped to Russia, can send to China, still make a profit as long as they're involved in some of the production arrangements and so on. Uh, and the Chinese have been very deferential, very respectful about Russia's security. They make care not to sell to, uh, advanced military weapons to any of the Central Asian countries. Uh, they're quite happy to have Russia maintain a uh, dominant security role there. We haven't seen any major effort by the Chinese to derail the CSTO's gradual accreditation of power and authority. Uh, and so it's sort of a harmonious relationship. And the question, of course, is how long this will last. I'll come to that at the end. Um, the other tools that the Chinese use, in addition to working with Russia and bilaterally, they have a they have cooperation. They don't call it defense cooperation; it's more security cooperation, focused on anti-terrorism, on joint exercises with the, the Kazakhs and Kyrgyz and countries they share borders with. Um, they will, as as far as we understand it, provide a lot of assistance with uh, internal security equipment, uh, internet control software communications, monitoring, these training, and so on. Um, some minor assistance. It's not been a major theme in China's relations with these countries. Uh, it's, uh, it's certainly the Chinese now are changing their policy towards Afghanistan, seeming to become a bit more uh, open about working with the Chinese, with the Afghan government, on, on dealing with some of its internal security problems. And it might extend to Central Asia as we go forward. Um, in it, the they also have a lot of, uh, the, the Chinese will argue that a lot of their, their economic cooperation with the Central Asians is actually, a, a, it helps their security, I mean, helping them develop their energy resources, helping raise their investment, and teaching skills, that they consider that a contribution to human security, and potentially alleviating sources of discontent. Uh, and so they feel comfortable saying, as in Afghanistan, that throughout Central Asia, they're contributing to security by, by through, through their non-military tools. Uh, and in return, Central Asian governments have been very deferential to China and key issues. They, they make sure there's every time there's a declaration they meet, they reaffirm there's only one China, and then China is based in Beijing. Uh, they will do what, they, what the Chinese uh, ask, as far as we can tell, of dealing with potential uh, weaker extremist groups within their countries. Uh, they profess solidarity with a lot of Chinese goals. There was no talk about boycotting the Beijing Olympics, for example. Uh, and so on. Um, and they share this animus towards what the Chinese refer to as the three evil forces of, of, of separatism, uh, religious extremism, and terrorism. Uh, and that's worked out fairly well. The Chinese haven't, as far as they come, been too heavy handed in how they deal with Central Asians. They rely mostly on positive inducements and trying to get them to do governments to do things. And it's not very costly for the governments to do the things the Chinese want. You know, put up Declaration of Taiwan and in, 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 in a joint statement, and so that hasn't doesn't appear to be many strains between them. Uh, in addition, there's also the multilateral structures. Uh, there's very, there are a variety of them. Again, Chinese will argue that their development work to the, the uh, is is part of this, but it's primarily focused with the, the, the China Cooperation Organization, um, and that's as we all know, it's been a very interesting institution. I mean. Came out of nowhere as the Shanghai Five, as a, a natural revolution with the Soviet Union breaking apart, China now facing a border <laughs> for independent countries that had to regularize the relationship. So the leaders would meet annually in the Shanghai Five context, and that helped pull back some of their forces and just basically establish a, what had been totally sealed borders, helped to you know, move that process along and try and get them open or at least non militarized. Uh, and then in 2001, they five was converted to an organization. Uzbekistan, one country doesn't border China, uh, enters the, 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 the structure. Uh, they set up a couple institutions, the RAT, three strong structures I visited, and they have a secretariat. But that's it. They don't have 
very many institutions, and these are not very strong institutions uh, within the Cheyenne Art Corporation organization. Um, and there was a lot of concern a few years later when the U.S. about and the U.S. about this anti you know, sort of regional authoritarian bloc emerging with Russia and China and the Central Asian countries allied against NATO. There was the, the speculation that they were somehow involved in the expulsion of the U.S. forces from Uzbekistan, were trying to get the U.S. forces out of uh, Kyrgyzstan and so on. It sort of, then it sort of died because the institution itself was basically stagnated. It has a lot of potential, you know, large population, um, very important countries, some of very strong militaries, some of the leading producers and consumers of energy, uh, and dairy could have one located in very pivotal locations where there aren't other strong feed institutions. But for whatever reason, it didn't really take on much momentum. It just sort of stalled. They set up these institutions, a development fund, business council, and so on. But then, uh, their, the economic dynamism, even they themselves, have not really gotten anywhere. Most of what they do in terms of these deals and, and so on, and that's economic, they're really just China launching some initiative with one or more of the Central Asian countries and then saying it's part of the SEO under that framework. Um, but that's about it. And I think you could argue that in many ways. You've got a, a lot of potential, but not the liberals just haven't been there yet. Uh, uh, in terms of energy, there hasn't been much progress in the establishing any kind of uniform block. Foreign policy divisions and, 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 the, and, the, and the unity. I mean, there have been some coordination in their declarations, you know, make statements that harmonize with the Russian and Chinese view about we need more, more democracy in international relations. We have to show greater respect for the UN, you know, even the laterals and so on. Uh, but that's it. It's, it the, the, it's beyond declarations. There hasn't been much foreign policy coordination beyond that. Um, what you, you've seen clear differences, for example, with the Russian uh, uh, in uh, occupation or of uh, uh, the, uh, the South Ossetia and Khazia, how that is not been taken up by the other SEO uh, members, despite what appeared in my explanation that it would be. Even in Afghanistan, in 2012, they made Afghanistan an observer. They brought in Turkey as a dialogue partner. And it looked like they had you know, all the major players that you want to do something with Afghanistan. I mean, you've got uh, pretty much all, uh, many of the party countries, you've got Pakistan and Iran as observers in it, you have India involved as an observer. Uh, plus, and you think that if there's going to be an initiative dealing with Afghanistan from the region, the SEO would be a natural form for that to emerge. But as it has nothing, the latest declarations are they just plan to monitor the borders and work participate in joint international meetings dealing with Afghanistan and focus on preventing drug trafficking, which is, of course, a major concern to China, and, but especially to Russia. But that's about it. So overall, you have these lack of the liberals. Now, it might change, you know, because we've got now, there it appears there actually is going to be a change in the membership for the past decade. It's stagnated. You've got, you had the four, the, the six founding members, and that was it, despite the interest in others joining. They may, it looks like they're going to bring in the Pakistan at the end of this year, to at least to make that invitation. Uh, so that could impart some more momentum to the, the structure. But on the other hand, you now have these strong competing structures. CSTO is clearly one. I mean, CSTO off offers certain advantages to Russia that, that China it, China's not a member, so it would be easier for Russia to legitimize an intervention. Uh, it actually is a real military structure and it has real capabilities, at least on paper, which CSTO does not. They, they insist that their exercises are primarily anti terrorist. You could argue a bit because the, the forces, of course, are involved are not that focused, but for the most part, the exercises have been multi purpose and not really designed to develop into, an, uh, I would argue, into a military structure. More, some originally was to facilitate Russian arms sales, improve their tactical efficiency, emphasize on uh, strengthening capabilities. And you've seen this over time, they've become more comfortable moving together. Um, but for the most part, they, aside from these annual get togethers, they don't really operate well in practice apparently as a unit. There's no sense that they could organize an intervention in a neighboring country very quickly. It's been more, as I would argue in general, why the value of the SEO has been so far as sort of mutual reassurance for the participants. It allows them to, the Russians to make clear to China they're comfortable with some Chinese security wall in Malaysia, and the Chinese through the SEO can make clear that they respect Russia's uh, important role in the region. These Central Asian countries are happy about being able to deal with Russia and China, not necessarily one on one, but being sort of a multilateral structure gives them a bit more leverage. And it, the, the SEO principles themselves, non intervention, respect for divergent paths of development, and so on, it's something that's very comfortable. Uh, 
but we now have the two challenges, one Afghanistan, still not if the NATO continues to fly, but in fact somebody's going to do something in Afghanistan. It could be the CSPO, but uh, it, it, could, it should possibly be the SEO. And then now you've got some competing institutions that are coming up. You've got now the uh, the, the, the COTSI, the confidence building structure for the projects uh, originally launched and the first picked up the confidence building in, in Asia, I forget the exact title, but it's basically uh, an attempt to apply the OCL model to Asia and broaden it. Uh, and the Chinese have taken over the chairmanship of this last year and put a lot of effort into it. She made a major statement there, and that theory could offer the Chinese an alternative structure, whereas in the past they saw the SEO as their organization. Now they have another one. It's a broader membership, less influence of Russia, more potentially more useful for China. It includes a bunch of countries in there, and observers are members, including Iran, Israel, and so that's a, another potential option. And then the last wild card is if there's all we, it's been receding of each time NATO sends its its uh, its presence, it becomes less an issue. But there's always this question of what happens if NATO draws and Russia isn't able to maintain. Uh, security, as the Chinese see it, of their investments and interests in Central Asia. Then the Chinese have to face the issue, well, are we still comfortable with trying to isolate ourselves and contain the problem, or do we have to actually go in uh, and, and perhaps take up a larger military presence? In the past, there's been serious obstacles to the Chinese, as, as, which, uh, as Sebastian mentioned earlier, that the Central Asians aren't particularly interested in developing, working with the Chinese military. The Chinese themselves haven't been particularly interested. Uh, a lot of barriers, different military histories. Their really priorities are focused on other regions, at least where the Chinese were concerned. Uh, no military facilities the Chinese had in Central Asia. Language barriers were pretty severe. Uh, they, you know, Central Asian officers were in Russian, very few until recently learned Chinese. And then the general deference to the Russian lead. But this may be changing. I mean, the Chinese may feel that, given their growing concern about stability and terrorism in Xinjiang, given their growing economic uh, interests, desire to, to, to see the region develop economically, uncertainties over Russia. If Russia doesn't seem to be able to play that role, the Chinese want to maybe consider adopting a higher profile in the region. And that's going to be an interesting debate, I'm sure. Richard, thank you.